Okay, so today's um, today's lecture, uh, which starts now, uh, is uh, going to be on the stuff that's in seawater that's not the water. So last um, last lecture uh, before Innovative Learning Week, um, we talked a lot about the the water that makes up the ocean and the properties of the, in particular, the hydrogen bond that give that water special properties which allow it to, to behave in a way which like, leads to there being a possibility of life on Earth um, and whatnot. But today we're going to be talking about some of the stuff that's basically dissolved in that water that makes it the ocean as opposed to, to just a glass of distilled water. Okay, so we're going to be talking largely about sea salts, but we'll just go over some other stuff. Well, so, um, so the... Um, the ocean, well, the stuff that's not water in the ocean is largely sea salt. Okay, and sea salt, as I'm sure you'll know, is mostly sodium chloride. There's some other stuff in there, which we'll talk about uh, as well. Um, but it's basically dissolved inorganic ions make, make up most of uh, what we would refer to as sea salt, the kind of stuff you put on your um, chips and battered jumbo haggis. Um, okay, there's other stuff. Uh, as well. Um, so in addition to these kind of like inorganic ions, there are these other things which we call nutrients, uh, so nitrogen, phosphorus, to a certain extent silicon, uh, which is used for building the shells of uh, little beasties. Um, so these are also inorganic um, uh, molecules, so nitrates and silica uh, silicate and phosphorus, um, or phosphate even. Um, but we, they are kind of a separate class of um, inorganic molecules, so separate apart from what we've traditionally put as salts, in that they're basically they're really useful in terms of life. So life uses these uh, these special elements, these nutrients, to exist. Um, so these are kind of uh, this is what you get when you Google nutrients. You get this. So to, for all of this biological activity to happen, it has to have these nutrient elements um, to enable basically uh, photosynthesis to happen. A whole variety of biochemical processes require those elements. Okay, so this is just a, 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 a map of, uh, this is chlorophyll A, so this is basically a map showing where biological activity is going on. This is a map of how much photosynthesis, <laughs> how much photosynthesis is happening, and you can see that it's not kind of evenly distributed over the whole oceans, uh, it's quite close around the coasts and in, uh, along the equator, and, and the reason for that is these are the regions which that are supplied by the nutrient-like elements. And we'll, we'll come on to talk about how that happens in uh, the next lecture, or the next lecture that I give, because there's, there's some other lectures in between. Um, anyway, uh, um, there are also gases dissolved in the ocean, so it's not just um, uh, dissolved ions, we also have dissolved gases. So this is uh, 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 an image of the seabed, I think in Italy somewhere, and you can see that there are gases bubbling up through the ocean here because this is on top of a volcano. But there are also gases dissolved in the liquid. So carbon dioxide is one of the most important of those gases. But there are also things like oxygen, which is important if you're a fish and you want to breathe. Um, things like also kind of all of the gases that are in the atmosphere, so nitrogen, argon, all that kind of stuff, are also dissolved in the ocean as well. So there'll be electron as well. Okay, so these are the major gases dissolved in the ocean. I'm sure you can read those in your own time. Some of them are useful, like oxygen, carbon dioxide. Some of them are less useful, like nitrogen. It's very inert. Um, and then we come on to these things which we would kind of usually refer to as trace elements. So these are, these are essentially other uh, salt-like um, uh, elements, but they're only present in very, very low concentrations. Okay, and we'll come on to why their concentration distributions are slightly different to things like sodium or chlorine. But uh, these are elements that get added to the ocean and things like this. So this is a dust plume, this is a dust storm in Africa, a very dusty continent. And that's blowing out dust into the Atlantic Ocean. And that's bringing with it a whole bunch of elements which we usually associate with terrestrial materials, so things like iron and aluminium. And they're being added to the ocean in very small quantities. Okay? So it looks like there's a lot of stuff being added here. But the ocean is really big. Okay, so this, this dust plume is actually a very small event in, in terms of the overall chemistry of the ocean. Okay, and these are some of the, those trace elements. So they're, they're usually measured in things like parts per million or even parts per billion. Um, there are some trace elements which are even lower concentration. So, um, for instance, one of the elements that I do my research on 
Uh, thorium is present in... Reactions. So, for instance, this is an, an enzyme, nitrogenase, which is important for some biological activity. This is particularly for important for the fixation of nitrogen gas into usable forms of nitrate. Uh, sorry, usable forms of nitrogen. Uh, in this case, uh, ammonium, um, or ammonia, which then gets converted to ammonium. Uh, but this this large organic molecule here wouldn't work. It wouldn't fulfil its biochemical function if it didn't have these um, little. Uh, uh, metal sites. Uh, so, if I see if I can. So, these little things here. There's a phosphate cluster here, and there's a cluster here of um, of, of, of um, atoms that include iron and molybdenum. So, these are these are as far as the overall composition of this uh, huge molecule. It's got you know, many thousands of, uh, not many thousands, hundreds of maybe uh, carbon atoms. But there's, it's those one or two iron atoms that make that molecule do the thing that it does. Without the iron. You could not, that molecule wouldn't work. Okay, so you wouldn't be able to fix nitrogen in the ocean without small amounts of iron. Okay, uh, and this is this basically the same. So this is a this is a, a, a bloom of a, um, a kind of a marine plankton called Trichodesmium. And you can see that it's blooming here, you get lots and lots of these. I mean, this is bazillions of cells floating around in the ocean, that's why it looks black brown. And it's basically forming that function here, which for those of you that did evolution of the living earth. We'll remember that the nitrogen cycle has got all these kind of different wacky processes going on over here. But it's this one that converts nitrogen gas into ammonia and then into ammonium. So this process here is basically driven by that molecule inside uh, these little trichodesmian beasties. And that molecule only works because of the iron that's there. So, so even these things, these trace elements, sometimes referred to as micronutrients, are really important for what goes on in the ocean. Moving on. Okay, and there's also, I guess finally, another class of components which is basically the organics. So there are some organic molecules that are kind of just dissolved in the ocean, um, and they're basically the result of uh, bits of things that were living. Okay, so in here we've got like some chicken and some chips and some donuts and a couple of stuff, but um, it's basically anything that was alive in the ocean. However, that's been processed either through dying or being eaten or uh, anything that those organisms secrete, those will eventually break down into simpler organic molecules. And that organic molecules, that, that pool of organic molecules in the ocean forms basically another kind of type of thing that's dissolved in the ocean. In this case, it's basically a reservoir of organic carbon that can be used for stuff, so eaten by other organisms or not. So it's not just things like food, but also things that anything that's been through an animal, okay, or been through anything that's been living, in this case, the emoji of poop. Um, but that's that kind of anything. So basically, there's a lot of organic material in the ocean that's been processed through um, organisms. OK, and, and these are all those kind of things. Um, some of these, <coughs> so some of these things are I mean, naturally occurring. I mean, I guess all of these things that can be dissolved in the ocean uh, can be considered naturally occurring. Um, but uh, in any situation where you add too much of those, Okay, those can be considered pollutants. And we'll come on to pollution in the last lecture. Um, so things like um, too much fat in the ocean can be considered a pollutant. If you put lots of fat into a river, that's probably bad. Um, we've put lots of hormones uh, into um, the ocean and into rivers and stuff like that through um, uh, uh, contraception. Uh, so there's lots of estrogen whacking around in the environment, which is pretty bad um, uh, if you're like a fish. Um, Anyway, uh, but the rest of, well, most of this lecture we're going to talk about um, sea salt. So, uh, so this guy here is floating uh, in the Dead Sea because there's lots and lots of salt dissolved in this. So this is not the ocean, this is the Dead Sea um, in Israel slash Palestine. Um, so we're going to talk about sea salt. So sea salt, approximately 3.5% of the mass of, of seawater is these dissolved inorganic iron sea salt. So we sometimes see this referred to, instead of using percent, quite a lot of the time in uh, geosciences we use this term here, per mil. So instead of this is parts per thousand rather than parts per hundred. So it's got this little extra zero on the bottom here. So 35 per mil of the mass of um, seawater is the salts. 
And you can see broken up down here the kind of the things that it's made of. So mostly chlorine, sodium, and then some of these other guys here. So sulfate, magnesium, calcium, all those kind of goodies. Okay. So that's what it's made of. Okay. Um, and this is a table of that, which I don't expect you to read right now, but you can see that you know the percentage of ions or the per mil of ions is not the same as the, the weight because different ions weigh different amounts. Okay, just be aware of that if someone asks you a question about it. Um, <clears throat> but where does, where, where does this stuff come from? So at the top here, this table up here, is uh, the, uh, I guess, the, uh, an approximation of the average composition of rocks of the continental crust. And you can see up there that it's mostly silicon, aluminium, iron, okay? Stuff that's, you know, rocky tan, kind of, blah, rocky kind of elements. Uh, but the stuff in seawater, that's not that. Okay, so it's not, we're not just weathering um, rocks and putting those into the sea. Other things are happening to preferentially allow different elements into the sea and keep other stuff behind, okay? And in this case, we can see that iron and aluminium are not really weathered out from the um, rocks into the ocean. And that's because those elements are not very soluble in river water. Okay, so if you weather the rock, the rock is completely gone. Um, all of that stuff must end up in solution at some point, but the iron and the aluminium don't really make it all the way to the ocean. They quite often get precipitated out as secondary minerals um, uh, that, uh, that get trapped in, kind of trapped in rivers, trapped in sedimentary basins, trapped in estuaries, trapped in the coastal environment. They don't make it into kind of the dissolved pool of elements in the ocean. Okay, so that's kind of like that, what that says. Okay, so this is, the, this is the composition of river water. So we can see that the composition of river water is a little bit more like the composition of the ocean. Okay, so it doesn't have that iron and aluminium, but it still has other stuff in it, right, that's not really in seawater. So the, um, it has quite a lot of silica, quite a lot of bicarbonate, quite a lot of calcium, not much sodium and not much chlorine. Okay, so we have to think about where is the ocean actually getting these other these where it's kind of its composition of salt from if the composition of the stuff that's flowing in from the land is not the same okay so that's a bit of a puzzle okay so these are this is a back table described as like a little picture thingy pie chart it's not science this is a pie chart um, so this pie chart here hopefully on the next slide I'll have um, and so there are um, so that pie chart doesn't look like the first pie chart Okay, so it had a dip, the ocean and the rivers, different compositions. So there are these other places where we could be thinking about where the ocean gets its dissolved salts from. Where does it get all these ions from? So other than, so up the top here, this is kind of a depiction of uh, this guy up here. This is a depiction of uh, what's coming in in rivers. This is uh, a river and this is some sediment coming out. But uh, So that's bringing elements into the ocean. But there are these other sources as well. So uh, Vent emission. So these are this is basically stuff that goes on interaction with seawater with underwater volcanoes. Okay, so this is the, the continent, the oceanic crust interacting with seawater, and then volcanoes on land and in the ocean. When they erupt, they they also um, give us lots of goodies. Um, so hopefully this will play, and we'll see some. So we can see here that this is a this is an example of a hydrothermal system. So you've got the, uh, something like a, a mid-ocean ridge here, and all of the brown stuff, that's basalt rock. Uh, and what happens is there that you're not directly taking uh, elements, uh, we're not directly taking elements from down here in the mantle up into the ocean. What happens is this, this part of the crust here is very hot, okay? Because lots of volcanic activity going on there, it's quite close to the mantle. So that creates, basically, the water in that rock heats up, expands, and comes out at these kind of smokers down here. Do you see the smokers again? These are black smokers that form <coughs> on these mid-ocean ridge kind of hydrothermal sites. And seawater then recirculates through this hydrothermal system. So seawater comes through here. It basically leaches the rock. Okay, so it doesn't completely weather it, but it's it basically you have a high temperature fluid that goes through that, and it strips out some of the elements. So it strips out the elements. It strips out iron. It strips out some chlorine, it strips out magnesium. Those get stripped out and added to the ocean, okay? Now, some of those elements don't really like being 
dissolve in the ocean, like iron for instance, and they precipitate straight back out again. And uh, so these, these sediments here are basically, you have basically insoluble elements being pumped into the ocean and then they precipitate out again. Okay? And that's where we get uh, quite a lot of our metal deposits, so like copper ore deposits, things like that are formed. But it, but it does mean that some stuff that doesn't precipitate out adds to the pool of salts in the ocean. Okay, and moving on to the next. Okay, the other... Okay, so this is, this is a slightly longer video, but, but the, other, the other source of, um, of, of, of particular elements like chlorine and fluorine uh, and sulfur are added to the ocean uh, through volcanic activity. So this is, uh, this is some, some pictures of some volcanoes erupting. And those volcanoes are erupting because there are gases that are held in the magma, either uh, recycled through a subduction zone or primary kind of melts from the mantle, contain a lot of gases. And those, those gases are expanding and causing the explosions. But once they've expanded and caused the explosions, those gases are then in the atmosphere. Okay? So volcanic gases include mostly carbon dioxide, uh, sulfur dioxide, things like that, which you might have covered uh, a little bit in ELE from their climatic effects. But there are also other gases in there as well. So hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen chloride, and those uh, gases uh, precipitate out eventually uh, through acid rain and go into the oceans. So most of the chlorine in the oceans comes from a process like this that goes from the atmosphere and down into the ocean. <coughs> Okay, so the last last little video is looking at the river flux. So this is a uh, this is a river sorry, Switzerland. Um, surfing, um, and, uh, and basically the, the point of this is to, so you can see the river. There's quite a lot of stuff in the river. Okay, it's quite muddy. Yeah, uh, you might see some trees when I pass. But there's lots of stuff in the river. But it's not just the stuff that you can see. The stuff that you can't see is the, the total dissolved solids. Um, so. The, um, but there are these. Uh, okay, the tree is not coming. Never mind. Um, but but if you remember one thing from this, then certainly it is. Uh, not um, but um, in addition to all of this stuff going down this river, there is some dissolved material. Okay. And girls can surf as well. It's a girl surfing. There we go. And let's see how she does. Okay, so uh, at the end of last, my last lecture, uh, we talked about this, why the, the, the ocean was salty. Okay, so all of these things that are being, all of these sources, okay, the rivers, the volcanoes, the hydrothermal activity, they're all adding salts to the ocean. Okay? So they're all adding, they're also all adding goodies into our ocean here. But when that water evaporates, okay, only the water is evaporated back over the land. Okay? A small amount of salts comes back. So we do get like sea spray on back from the ocean onto the land. Um, if uh, you know after there's been it's been particularly stormy, if you lick a car, it's a bit salty. I mean don't lick a car, but you know that but <laughs> don't do that. Um, okay, so um, we've got this, this 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 we've still got this this um, this conundrum that although we've got all these different sources of salts to the ocean, the ocean is a very different composition to the sources. Okay, so uh, things like particularly things like chlorine and sodium, they're not added at the same rate that all of the other stuff is added. Okay, so uh, if we just summed up all of the sources and did that recycling of water, okay, we still wouldn't get the same composition of salts as we have. Okay, so uh, it's not just what's added to the ocean that matters, it's also what we take out, okay? So that what, I mean, if you have, um, basically if you have a bucket of stuff, the composition of that, the, your bucket of stuff, depends on what you add to that bucket, but also what you take out, okay? Um, so if you have, if you have a, I don't know, if you have a big um, box of quality streets at Christmas, Right, okay, and your, your mum comes on, keeps on topping it up with fresh quality streets. Okay, the composition of what the you know, how many, how many orange creams, which are the nicest, right? How many of those are left in that bucket is not just how many are added by your mum, uh, or other carer, 
Um, but uh, it's also how many you eat, so how many you take out. So that the input flux and the output flux are just as important when determining what the composition of the, the, uh, the of sea salt is. Okay, so there are all these different ways that we can take stuff out. Okay, so we talked a little bit. So you can you can take salts out of the ocean by forming sea spray. Okay, and that sea spray blowing over the land. Okay, and then that gets deposited on land, and that removes every element that's in the ocean in that drop of spray at the same rate. Okay, um, some elements absorb onto different minerals, and that can be quite element specific. So particularly things like iron uh, and manganese, they they can absorb onto stuff and be preferentially removed. Um, so precipitates from seawater, I mean, this is things like salt. So sea salt is made from evaporation of seawater. And in some places, that happens naturally to a such an extent that salt is removed from the ocean. OK? So that's one of the few ways that, um, that salts are removed from the ocean. Um, forming shells and organic matter. So this is one of, the, one of the really major fluxes of stuff out from the ocean. So this is. If you're, if, you're, if you're a little uh, animal or a, uh, like a foraminifera or a coccolithophore or something like that, you build a shell. That shell is made of calcium carbonate or strontium carbonate or opal, which is a form of silica. That sinks, goes down to the seafloor. That's removed a little bit of calcium or a little bit of strontium out of the ocean. Okay, so there's a flux out of the ocean by things making shells. Um, you can volcanic reactions and see that's similar to this absorption onto other minerals. So when water flows through a hot rock, some of the elements in that hot rock stick onto the, the, the hot rock. And then there's this other term, burial in sediments. And this is really straightforward. If you form some sediments on the seafloor, the pore space in those sediments will be full of seawater. If you subduct those sediments into a, into a, into a um, subduction zone, I guess, traditionally, um, that's removed a little bit of seawater, therefore a little bit of salts from the ocean. Okay, so all these different processes that, that happen to remove stuff. Okay, and we can see uh, a little diagram of some of these processes happening. So you can see that uh, ions are brought in from rivers and brought in from volcanoes, and there's an exchange of ions between seawater and rocks down here. So this tends to bring out leach, calcium, and potassium out from the the rocks, but when seawater circulates back through these rocks, magnesium and sulfur get stuck in the rocks. So basically, it removes. It's like a filter, removing ions from the, the ocean. Okay, and then within the ocean, okay, so little beasties that, that form shells will take up bicarbonate, um, calcium sulfate maybe, um, and they will sink down to the seafloor and be that those elements will be removed from the ocean. And you'll also get removal from things like salt formation. Okay, and then burial, burial of sediments, you know, can remove stuff as well. And they go into the rock cycle, which is very slow. Okay, and this is this is a table of all that. I think you have the table. Do you have the table? Yeah, somebody one person nodded, so I'm assuming you all have the table, right? So I'm not gonna read the table. Um so uh it's for different elements, these processes of addition and removal happen at different rates. Okay, and this is important for determining whether that element gets concentrated in sea salts or gets preferentially removed. So in the case of something like chlorine, that comes out of a volcano, it's actually quite a small flux. So that goes into the ocean and then is removed by um, sea salts, okay, by salt formation, by evaporation of seawater. Okay, those are very small fluxes. So, um, and the uh, chlorine is a very soluble element, okay? So that means that the ocean can hold a lot of it, okay? Now, the, uh, this side over here, the other side is representing silicon. Now, if you remember from the composition of, say, river water, rivers have got a lot of silicate in them, okay? So the flux of silicon into the oceans is much larger than the flux of chlorine into the oceans, okay? But the concentration of silicon in the oceans is much less than the concentrations of chlorine. And the reason for that is because the output flux is also very large. Okay? So even though you're adding silicon to the oceans, you're removing it before it can accumulate in the ocean, basically. And in this case, it's basically forming the shells of these things called diatoms, which are kind of just like you know, the bottom rung of the, uh, the food chain kind of ladder there. If you, I mean, if you get reincarnated, diatom is kind of like a, you've been bad. Um, 
nice though. Um, okay, so we've kind of explained that, that different things are preferentially added or removed from seawater, and we're going to discuss this concept of uh, constant proportionality. Okay, so we'll come back to this a little bit later, but basically, for, for some of the salts, so for some of the salt elements, so sodium, chlorine, um, uh, potassium, sulfur, um, things like, um, almost sometimes you can consider um, calcium as, as this as well. Because the fluxes into the ocean are, are very small compared to the amount of stuff that's in the ocean, the concentrations don't really change very much through time. Which means that the ratios of each of the different elements stays the same. So everywhere you go into the ocean, if you did the ratio of sodium to chlorine, or potassium to sodium, or sulfur to chlorine, that, that ratio will always be the same. Okay? And this is very powerful because it then enables us to only measure... Okay, so the, it, this is, if we wanted to know how much of one thing there was, how much chlorine there was, or how much sodium, we don't have to measure it. We can just measure one of the elements, and that will tell us the concentration of all of the others that follow this um, constant of uh, uh, um, constant ratio um, thing. Okay, and this is this is one of the machines that we use to measure um, salinity of the water. So this is this. I mean, back in the day, we uh, we just measured um, the total. Uh, if we wanted to know how much salt was in the ocean, okay, you couldn't um, you couldn't take the seawater and dry it down and weigh what was left because some of those salts would evaporate and then some of the some of the water wouldn't evaporate, so it would be held in hydrous minerals. So instead of doing that, we basically we used this constant proportionality where we just measured the amount of chlorine. Okay, and if we know the amount of chlorine, that means we know the amount of all of the other. Um, we would call them conservative or the constant proportional. <coughs> Okay. So the salinity would just be 1.8 something 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 times the amount of chlorine. And we could do, and that's also, we also do it that way because measuring the amount of chlorine is a way that um, is, is, is chemically very simple, simple in that you can basically just do a titration. Um, and there, I mean, there are the details of the titration, not really very important. But, um, but we don't do that anymore uh, because the amount of salt dissolved in uh, in water is proportional to how conductive it is. Okay, so fr pure water is almost a uh, perfect insulator. Salty water, um, you know, don't drop a toaster in a bath of salty water because that would be bad. Um, so we basically just measure the conductivity of the water now and that tells us the salinity. But that's just like a historical. Um, and these are basically so, I mean, this is the amount of chlorine in the water is proportional to the amount of. Salinity. I mean, you can draw a graph if you want to. Um, okay. So, um, I'm going to describe this. What do we mean by a steady state? Why doesn't it change through time? Okay, so if we're looking at, um, uh, say, the processes of addition and removal, okay, so if we've got, say, say erosion. You know, it could be erosion and volcanoes and hydrothermal. We just it's called erosion is adding salt, and then we're removing salt or removing, say, chlorine by um, burying stuff in sediments, burying pore water in sediments, and then subducting that. So that the concentration of salt or sodium chloride or whatever element we're interested in that's remaining in the ocean, okay, is going to be a balance of those inputs and outputs. Okay. So, for almost all of the removal mechanisms, the rate at which you take something out of the ocean is related to how much stuff there is in the ocean. So the easiest way to think about this is, is from the, the example we've got here of, of basically just a, a simple chemical precipitate. Okay? <coughs> so the rate at which you form, okay, this is, this is you, know, you might have done this when you were seven, uh, um, but not eight, um, a, uh, this is, uh, copper sulfate solution and you're precipitating out a little crystal of copper sulfate. Okay? So the rate at which you can grow that crystal, the rate of removal of copper from the solution, okay, is dependent on the concentration of the solution. Okay? So if you have a very low concentration solution, the rate of removal will be low. Okay? Whereas if you've got a high concentration, okay, the rate of removal will be faster. Okay? 
So because the rate of removal is dependent on the concentration of the solution, this kind of acts to moderate the concentration of stuff in solution. So if you have, say, if we suddenly dumped a load of extra um, copper, or well, let's use the example of the ocean, right? So if we put loads of extra sodium chloride into the ocean, okay, that would increase the concentration of sodium chloride in the ocean, right? Adding more stuff in. But as soon as we've done that, okay, the removal rate would also go up, okay, because we've raised the concentration, so more salts will be precipitated out, okay, in regions of evaporation, and also more salt will be removed in pore water, okay, because we're removing, because the pore water will have a higher concentration of salt in it. And what that effectively means is that it moderates any changes in concentration. Okay, so if we change the concentration, the remove because the removal rate is dependent on that concentration, it will kind of act to, 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 to smooth out the any changes. So concentrations of some of these uh, very, very soluble salts tend to stay constant through time. Okay, now we're going to go on and talk a little bit about this concept called residence time. So residence time is is basically the average amount of time an, an atom of that salt, that element, is in the ocean or in any reservoir. Okay, and it's quite a useful property to know because if you can calculate the residence time, you can predict how something might change through time. Okay, you might predict whether it's possible that that thing has changed or not. Okay. So, but before we talk about residence time, I just thought I'd put this up here and talk a little about mixing time. So. There's a concept called residence time, which is about how long something stays in the solution. And there's this concept called mixing time. You stop whizzing. Okay. There's this concept about mixing time, which is similar, but different. So the mixing time is the amount of time it takes for any variation in your fluid to become evened out. Okay. So the mixing time of, say, a cup of water or a cup of tea in this kind of like slightly sketchy Japanese anime uh, thingy here, um, is um, it's quite short. It doesn't take very long. Okay? But it's a property of the physical dynamics of that cup of water. So it'll have a, cup of, a cup of coffee, if we had two cups of coffee, okay, add milk into them, they're chemically identical. But if we stir one, okay, it'll have a shorter mixing time than the other one. Okay? So mixing time is a property of the physical dynamics of the thing, okay, uh, of the reservoir, not of its chemistry, okay. And this, I mean, this, these kind of things, these swirly patterns happen in the ocean as well. And I guess you might have seen stuff at the beginning of the lecture. There were some swirly patterns as well, okay. So mixing time is about mixing. Okay, so the residence time is is different. Okay, so with residence time, we're talking about uh, what is the the basically the relative sizes of the fluxes in and out of our reservoir, okay, um, relative to the amount of stuff in the reservoir, okay. So when we calculate these things, we assume a steady state, okay, so we'll come on to a little bit what, what that means in a bit, but basically if you want to calculate a residence time, the flux in and the flux out, you have to assume that they're the same, okay. And that means that the concentration in the reservoir is not changing. Okay? And there's the equation to work it out. Very super simple. Residence time, reservoir content divided by flux. You can work out the units from that in your own time. And the units are, of course, time of residence time. Um, okay, so if, let's, let's see what happens. So if, if one of these fluxes were to change, okay, it's basically how long would it take for the, the concentration or the amount of stuff in the reservoir to change? If, for instance, we increased the flux of stuff into the reservoir, and this stuff can be anything. Okay? It could be water itself, or it could be um, salt, it could be a nutrient, okay? it could be um, anything. Okay? So if we've increased the flux in, So if we, if we, I guess this is a graph of time against 
amount of stuff in our reservoir. So I start out with very constant case at the top, and then, and then, uh, and then uh, over time, the uh, uh, the concentration or the amount of stuff in the reservoir will start to increase. Okay, uh, but as if the concentration increases, the flux out should also increase because the flux out is dependent on the concentration. Okay, so you should then eventually reach a state where the concentration is not continuously going up because the flux out will have gone up. Okay, I should have made that arrow a little bit bigger. Okay, so the, 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 you start out in a, in a situation where you're in steady state with the amount of the flux in equals the flux out. Okay, and then you perturb that by making the fluxes different sizes, but then because the flux out is dependent on concentration, they will tend to, to a situation where the fluxes are equal again. Okay? But in this case, the concentration is now higher. Okay, so uh, you could do the similar kind of thing here. So um, uh, this time I've just made the flux out bigger. So you might be able to see that arrow slightly. So in this case, by increasing the flux out, the concentration goes down. Okay, but as the concentration goes down, the flux out will then also reduce as because it's related to the concentration in the reservoir. Okay, so the, the flux is proportional to the reservoir <coughs> size, and that's what moderates the uh, the change in the um, the reservoir size. Okay, so if we look at some of the, the time scales of these changes now. So if we look at uh, this one, so the amount, the amount of change has gone from 50, uh, gone from a reservoir size of say 100 kilograms or 100 beans or 100 bus loads or whatever unit you're, you're measuring your stuff in, it's gone down to 50, okay? So we could look at the time it takes to go to 75, so it's half of that difference, okay? And that, you might be familiar with the concept of half-life from radioactivity or whatnot, okay? So we could describe the residence time in terms of the, the, the half-life of that change. Okay, so we could do that, but what we actually do is we use um, this term called the mean life, okay, which is, which is related to the half-life, but instead of the time it takes to reduce to half, it's the time it takes to reduce to 1 over e, which is like one of these irrational numbers. Um, but uh, it turns out that that's quite useful because instead of the half-life being related here to log 2 over the decay constant, okay, so the, the residence time, if we use this 1 over e, is actually just 1 over the, the um, decay constant. So it, it's basically a mathematically simpler way of describing how fast it takes something to change if it's following this exponential um, decay thingy. So, the, um, so we actually define it as that. In this case, it takes 50 years, okay, to uh, get down to this 1 over e or 0.3 something, 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 something uh, of the total change, okay? So uh, you don't need to know all of this stuff down here, but basically uh, that number, T res, the, the residence time or the reservoir time, is the flux in or the flux out if it's at steady state divided by the reservoir size. Okay, no, the reservoir size divided by the flux, sorry. Um, and that turns out to follow this equation here. Okay, so that's why we use that one and not the half-life one. Um, so if we do that calculation, so this is the same example again. Uh, so we've reduced the flux out, so the concentration reduces over time. So I've calculated the res residence time uh, at the beginning. Okay, that's 50 years. Uh, and then as soon as we change something, the flux in doesn't equal the flux out, okay? So the, although I've got the, the residence time spiking up here, that's because I've, I've, the reservoir amount has stayed the same, but I'm using the flux out, okay, to calculate the residence time, uh, and I get a much bigger value because the flux out has reduced. Okay? So that's not... Um, that's basically that's that's it's, it's, it's meaningless that the calculation during in this hang on let me show you the little this part here the calculation of the residence time is meaningless because the flux in does not equal the flux out okay but over time over time the um, 
the, the, the residence time will approach this equilibrium value where the flux in equals the flux out. I should point out that um, the Excel file that I've used to create these, uh, these graphs, um, I've popped it on Learn, um, and it like draws the graphs and stuff like that. So you can have a play with that, you know, using changing fluxes in, changing fluxes out, changing reservoir sizes to see what, um, to see how it affects what happens with terms of how fast things can change their concentration. Um, and just an example of that, so if I start out with an initial flux of two, the, issue, the flux out equals two, so we start in a steady state, we've got a reservoir size of 100 kilograms Oh, no. Okay, so, uh, so, um, I don't know that thing. Anyway, um, so the elements with long residence times, okay, so if you've got a very long residence time, that means your concentration is very unlikely to change through time, which is why the elements like uh, chlorine, sodium, lithium, strontium, potassium, it's why we call those conservative elements because their concentrations relative to each other are not going to change by much. Okay? So the only way that you can really change the concentrations of those elements in the ocean is by taking water out of the ocean or adding water. Okay? So if you did that, so if you took water out of the ocean, the ocean would get more salty, the concentrations would go up, but the ratios, the amount of those relative to each other would stay constant. Okay? And you can see from this that, that basically the, the Chlorine has essentially got an infinite residence time because there's so much of it dissolved in the ocean. The fluxes are so small that it essentially will never change the amount of sodium uh, chlorine in the ocean. Okay, so composition of the, the ocean is basically so the amount that the types of salts in the ocean have, have been the same over all of, um, almost all of geological history, or at least the interesting parts of geological history. Um, which, um, which means that all of these different kinds of salt, which ultimately come from the ocean, uh, so this uh, artisan salt that Americans buy for $15, um, if you go to Stockbridge, you can buy uh, Himalayan pink rock salt, which ultimately came from the ocean probably 20, 30 million years ago. There's three pounds sixty on that, or you can go to Lidl and you can get twenty nine p salt. Okay, it's the same salt. Okay, so if you want salt, I'm not suggesting you have a high salt diet or anything like that, but buy the Lidl salt because it's chemically the same, ish. Okay, so um, some kind of reminders of, of what we've kind of done today. So the ocean is salty because uh, the flux is in. Okay, uh, are only really in, and, the flux, and we don't we recycle the water, but not the salts. Um, uh, but the flux is in uh, different compositions to what's in the ocean, and that's because we have these different removal mechanisms that affect different uh, like element specific. So, for instance, the formation of uh, calcium carbonate shells removes only calcium from the ocean and doesn't remove silicon or sodium. Okay, whereas um, different, so the different processes cause there to be different, um, determine what the composition of salt is in the ocean. 
Um, the residence time. Okay, so I put the residence time is okay, but you should hopefully go back through all of that stuff and figure out the difference between what a mixing time is and what a residence time is. And why having a long residence time means that the composition of something doesn't change. And having a short residence time means that basically, if you've got a residence time that is shorter than the mixing time, I didn't really explain this. So if, you're, if, you're, if your residence time is longer than the mixing time, okay, that means, so for instance, the ocean for sodium or chlorine, mixing time with the ocean is about 2,000 years. The um, residence time of chlorine is like super long. So that means that it's completely mixed for chlorine or sodium. Okay, so the, composite, the concentration will be the same everywhere. But for, um, for things that have got a very short residence time, okay, so like maybe silicon or some of the nutrients that are removed very rapidly, so their concentrations are very low relative to the fluxes, okay, that means that the ocean hasn't had time to mix out all of that variability in concentration. Okay? Which means that if you go and measure the concentration of different elements that have short residence times, is that you will find that the ocean is quite variable. Some places will have a lot of nitrate, some places will have no nitrate. Some places will have lots of silicon, some none. Some will have no iron, some will have lots of iron. Okay? And we'll come on and talk about those variations uh, next week after Simon's done his stuff. Okay. Okay, so um, have a look at the stuff and learn. It's hopefully useful. Um, and I will see you all next week. <laughs>